The room was silent, except for the hum of old machinery and the quiet shuffle of blueprints spread across a steel table. It was 1957, and somewhere deep inside, a Leningrad design bureau. A young engineer named Alexei stared at a problem that had stumped Western counterparts for years. He didn't have advanced computers or unlimited resources, but what he did have changed everything. Soviet engineers operated under a philosophy most of us would consider a handicap today. They were given constraints so severe that failure seemed inevitable. Limited materials, outdated tools, political pressure, and the constant weight of secrecy. Yet they built machines that reached space before anyone else. Submarines that moved silent as shadows, and aircraft that defied every assumption about what was possible. What they understood, and what we've mostly forgotten, is that genius doesn't emerge from abundance, it emerges from necessity. When you can't rely on the best materials, you learn to reimagine the entire design. When you can't buy your way out of a problem, you think your way through it. This wasn't just engineering. It was a survival mindset hardwired into every calculation and every sketch. The Soviet system forced engineers to think in layers. First, they analyzed the core function stripped of all luxury. What does this machine actually need to do? Not what would be nice, not what would impress, but what is the irreducible minimum? Then they worked backward, building only what served that purpose. Every gram mattered. Every weld had to justify itself. Efficiency wasn't a goal, it was the only option. Take the R-7 Semyorka rocket, the one that launched Sputnik and Gagarin into history. Western engineers were perfecting single-use boosters with complex staging systems. The Soviets couldn't afford that approach. So they clustered smaller engines together, engines they already knew how to build, and created a modular system that could be adapted and reused. It wasn't elegant by Western standards, but it worked, and it worked reliably. This wasn't recklessness. It was calculated pragmatism. Soviet engineers ran simulations in their heads because they didn't have access to supercomputers. They tested models by hand, sometimes using wooden mock-ups and water tanks to visualize airflow and pressure. They became masters of approximation, learning to feel when a design was right before the math even confirmed it. Intuition became data. But there was something deeper happening beneath the technical brilliance. These engineers were taught to see failure not as an endpoint but as information. In the West, failure often meant project cancellation, budget cuts, reputational damage. In the Soviet system, failure was expected, dissected, and folded back into the next iteration. It created a culture where experimentation wasn't feared. It was fundamental. Sergei Korolev, the architect behind the Soviet space program, embodied this philosophy completely. He survived the gulag, returned to engineering with nothing but his mind intact, and built a program that reached the stars. He didn't have the luxury of perfection. He had deadlines, skeptical officials, and rivals waiting for him to fail. So he built in redundancies, tested relentlessly, and never assumed success. Every launch was a lesson, whether it succeeded or exploded on the pad. What made Soviet engineering so formidable wasn't just the mindset of individual engineers, it was the structure itself. Design bureaus operated in parallel, competing for the same contracts, pushing each other toward innovation. There was no monopoly on ideas. If one team failed, another was already working on a solution. It created an ecosystem of relentless iteration, where stagnation meant obsolescence, and they documented everything. Not for glory or publication, but for survival. Every test, every failure, every minor adjustment was recorded in meticulous detail. Future engineers inherited not just machines, but the thinking behind them. It was a system designed to outlast individuals, to preserve knowledge across generations even when the original creators were gone. This approach produced results that still seem impossible today. The MIG-25 fighter jet, built mostly from steel instead of titanium, flew faster than anything the West had at the time. It wasn't supposed to work. Steel is heavy, prone to heat damage, inefficient. But Soviet engineers understood trade-offs. They knew that speed mattered more than weight in this context, and they designed around that singular priority. The plane became legendary, or consider the AK-47, perhaps the most recognizable product of Soviet engineering philosophy. Mikhail Kalashnikov didn't design the most accurate rifle or the most advanced. He designed the most reliable. It could be dropped in mud, frozen in snow, buried in sand, and still fire. It was simple enough that a barely trained soldier could field strip and reassemble it in darkness. Elegance through simplicity, power through resilience. These weren't accidents, they were the result of a mindset that valued functionality over aesthetics, adaptability over specialization, and long-term thinking over short-term profits. Soviet engineers built for scenarios where supply chains would collapse, where repairs had to happen in the field with minimal tools, where the environment itself was hostile. They built for reality, 
Not ideals. What surprised me the most wasn't just how a detailed engineering biography or historical documentary collection improved my understanding of Soviet innovation, but how everything started to feel different once I switched to the right one. I didn't expect such a clear change, and honestly, I tested more than a few before finding what actually worked. This isn't a promo or sponsorship, just sharing real results that made a noticeable difference for me. I'll leave the link below, in case you want to dig into it yourself and see what you mean. The Soviet engineering mindset offers something we desperately need today. In a world drowning in options, resources, and distractions, we've forgotten how to think clearly under pressure. We optimize for convenience and forget that real innovation happens when you can't take the easy path. Constraints aren't obstacles, they're filters that reveal what actually matters. You don't need unlimited resources to build something extraordinary. You need a clear purpose, a willingness to fail, and the discipline to learn from every mistake. You need to strip away everything unnecessary and focus on the core function. You need to build for resilience, not just performance. That's the lesson buried in those old Soviet blueprints, and it's as relevant now as it was in 1957. So maybe the next time you face a limitation, a budget cut, a missing tool, don't see it as a problem. See it as an invitation, an invitation to think differently, to build smarter, to create something that doesn't just work, but endures. That's what those engineers did in cold rooms with outdated equipment and impossible deadlines. And somehow, they reached the stars. Tell us which country or city you're watching from. See you in the next video. Bye.